terms of some sort of penalty because the guys in the back of the field, probably the last eight or ten cars, all wriggled. I couldn't work out. I thought someone must have indicated because what normally happens if you're driving and you've got a problem with a car, you look across to the flag marshals and you wave your hands and the yellow flag then comes out correspondingly on that line of the grid. But all of a sudden, the orange lights come on and then all of a sudden, just check this out. Yeah, so there's about three or four guys in the back and then you can see all those yellow flags there. But there was also a crop of cars around about uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 in that region of the grid where there was movement as well. So that, that's a very strange one. I've never seen that and try to get to the bottom of what's unfolded there. As Neil said, Pi went, but also one of the HRT cars and then to the right to the point where Bright, he didn't just flinch, he actually ended up right outside the lane. <laughs> so, and the race know. will be reduced by one lap, which is standard protocol in these situations. Yeah, that was odd. Everyone's eager to get on with it, including us. So it's going to be an interesting afternoon's racing. And uh, very often is the case with this that you just end up reacting to the cars around you. Let's get back downstairs with Greg. Crompo, I've actually just come up past the commentary box where you are up toward the final turn. As you know, a lot of crew chiefs and key team personnel stand on the grass here to watch their drivers and assist them at the start. Now, Paul Scalzo for Jason Bright tells me that the light went out. He thought it was it was game on. And then, of course, it came on again. So they're a bit perplexed. They don't feel like it's their fault. All right, that's important. And we'll try and get some onboard vision to see whether we can verify that and race control verifying on screen. Look for the light. Said. So watch the light. No, no, the light's still on. And then it goes to the delayed goes to start. The start. Yeah. Didn't go out. Just the orange light come on on the top. So that's what that's what's happened. And they've all flinched as a consequence of the light looking different. And because somebody's gone out of position, they've gone straight to the delayed start signals. So the light definitely didn't go out. In the old days we used to go from the red light to a green light. Now it's just the lights out. And in that particular case, it went to the orange illuminated light above the red light, which is the delayed start procedure. The problem now is you've used the clutch hard, you've parked them on the line hard, you've spooled them up against the line locker, and who can clear the clutch will be important. There is a rule in relation to triggering uh, a delayed or a false start as well, but I've also had a text from one of our senior executives in the company that thinks there might have also been a light issue. So, as there always is in motorsport, there's at least half a dozen views. You can <laughs> pick one. Okay. Whichever one you like. It's the lucky dip. So, look, we'll get to the bottom of it clearly, but uh, we're shortening up the race by one lap. And if there is a question mark, I doubt whether any penalties would likely be levied. So, we'll do it all again. Go through the reset process. And I've, in fact, just had a confirmation through that uh, flag, there flag. was a problem with the lights, and that's come from Tim Schenken himself. And Jason Bargwan has said no penalty. Thanks for the update, guys. The Thunder Roars again, take two, Sydney Motorsport Park, it'll be one lap fewer. Great jump, Mostert, beautiful start, and have a go at Lowndes on the outside. It's a supercharged move for his 600th supercar start. It's just like it was in 1996, only it's daylight, away he goes. You spoke about it before, what a start by Lowndes on position four around the outside of everybody. Mostert's start was superb, but Lowndes, absolutely fantastic to lead us away. Good start. I didn't think anybody would clear Mostert on the run to turn one. Van Gisbergen didn't convert quickly at all. He's dropped right back into sixth position. Turn five. Track limits have got to res be respected here on a cold tyre. Good start, Moffat and McLaughlin. And now, down the inside comes Van Gisbergen on forces, McLaughlin. Forces the argument. He's got the Red Bull holding up the inside. And they're going on with it as they get to the left-hander at the back of the hill. McLaughlin's not going to yield in a hurry because that gives him the inside running at the next right-hander at turn eight. Shane sticks it out on the outside. Coulthard's tucked in behind them in seven. It's pretty lively. Two New Zealanders, Van Gisbergen. And McLaughlin, they've had some history. If you remember at Bathurst, Shane fired up the inside of Scott. Scott hit the fence 
at the cutting. And they've had three or four other instances over the years. Pretty volatile. Thank you. And that's the Ludo chat to Lowndes. What a margin. Three quarters of a second for Lowndes over Mostert at the end of the first lap. Wild move around the outside. We'll no doubt catch some replays of all that shortly. But he's got air to play with now, Craig Lowndes, and that'll be handy. He can set his own rhythm, trim up his car and drive it gently. And that'll be a key word this afternoon, looking after tyres. So Lowndes, Mostert, Winker, Moffat, McLaughlin, Van Giesbergen, Coulthard, Pye, Rick Kelly, James Courtney, Garth Tander. That's down to 11, winner bottom, the local boy right in behind Tander. As you see Nick Perka down the inside, Tim Blanchard. Michael Caruso's on the radio saying that I was hung out on the grass. So he's in a battle there. You can see him with Chris Pitha and Mark Winterbottom. He's not happy about something going on in the mid-pack at the moment. Those fellas are arguing over 12, 13, 14. Check out the replay of the start. Watch out for Lowndes from row two. Mostert got a great jump. Shane Van Gisbergen went nowhere. And Lowndes blazed. And he went right <laughs> round the outside. Cold tyre, hooking gears. Online, no fuss. Straight to the lead. Just fantastic. Now, this is Wink Cup on the inside. So we're on board with Lowndes. It's a little move there. Little move, stop. That's close. Now, we can't see where it was. The wheel spin conversion was mint. Yeah. Beautiful for Lowndes. Look at this. Around the outside. And as a little lift of the throttle, he already tucked it down to the race line. He cleared Chaz by this point. This is Van Gisbergen. Oh, she bogged right down. It went all the way to the bottom of the run on revs. And now the train sneaks on by. Oh, the Volvo boys were very close. Another coat of paint and those two S60s would have would have connected. It'd be hard to work out though because it's the same colour. Good point. <laughs> if you look at these two, they're at it. So Still going. McLaughlin and Moffat locked in combat through two and three. <laughs> Still locked in combat. This is worth the price of admission in its own right. Now they're going to do it down here at turn four. That's great stuff. It was awesome. So Lowndes now with three quarters of a second lead over Mostert. Stabilised a little bit now. So Mostert, as we said before the start, has got the most amount of green tyres in the bank today. Two compulsory stops. Some, if there was a safety car, may actually choose to stop three times given what Neil explained in the Hino Hub and how hard it is on tyres. Watch this. This is Lowndes. And we're looking at Van Gisbergen on the outside. And yeah, it just, uh, he didn't clear the brake pedal either. So that was just a weird start for Shane, wasn't textbook that one? That was a very cool start for Craig Lowndes. You know what he did, buddy? He pushed Mostert across because I think if Mostert spun Lowndes on his 600th race, he wouldn't have been able to get out of the joint. Like the Sydneyites would have. <laughs> They absolutely got him. So Mostert did a good job to clear the throttle and let Lowndes come across. And Lowndes took a little bit of liberty there, which at this point, when you've got that much momentum and you're coming by, you can probably get away with without contact. Good job. Murph? Yeah, boys, just uh, bringing up about uh, Shane McGisberg, obviously dropped a long way back. We just saw that replay. You know how hard it is to get these things off the line. You use the line locker, so you've got your finger on that line locker button that holds the brakes on, the rear brakes on. And, or, no, front brakes, isn't it? And it looks like he's actually not released it. Well, there's a problem with that line locker because he sat there with the lights on for a long time and you said it bogged down massively. So he was unable to get the car free, I would say, because of that line locker. Yeah, maybe it didn't release. Well, I'm just sort of going through my head thinking of schematics because I don't think it has any bearing on whether the tail lights are on. No. It's, got, got, it's got nothing to do with that. If you think about the way in which the tail light switch works. So, and I saw a shot of them, so tail lights stop lights yep. they looked like they were on at the point of the start so yeah i'm not sure he may be a driver that rests his foot on both pedals he might have a brake position together with the throttle percentage don't know but you're right Merv. it's certainly weird and maybe the line locker could be part of it and they can actually line lock either in now so on board with mark winterbottom he's currently in 12th position closely following Tander running behind James Courtney who's having a pretty good battle there with Rick Kelly and Scott Pye. Running right on lap five of 51. Craig Lowndes, almost a second gap now to Mostert. Winkup, who was the man yesterday with probably the best car in terms of overall balance. Very, very good performance.
performance in terms of tyre conservation by Red Bull yesterday. Offit continues that little margin over McLaughlin. And there's James trying to get around the outside there. He won't be able to do it, but he might be able to get down the inside with the crisscross down into four. Can't get it done now, just a little bit too far back. There's a sneaky pass down the left-hand side here sometimes you can get away with into five. It's a high-risk one. You always make contact to do it, but... I love can't be done. gentle selling of it being sneaky. Most of the passes I see these guys do are anything but sneaky. They're bold and they're brash and they're usually involved one or two panel scrapes along the way. But I know what you mean. Some of them are not subtle. It's a bit like a sledgehammer typically. That is the art of overtaking, isn't it? Sometimes you need to be aggressive. You know there's going to be contact. Other times there's a, a pass which they're not ready for, and that's the one, the impromptu one, the spontaneous pass often is the one where you don't have contact and you get it done in a spot where people aren't ready for it. Position number four, James Moffat saying, I need a lot more turn in the car. The trade-off with that is you can often hurt the rear tyre more. He's actually trundling along nicely at the moment, James. He's 2.3 seconds from the lead. 2.36 seconds, so uh, position four, he's in front of McLaughlin and behind Wind Cup, so, and his time is representative of those around him the only guys that are demonstrably quicker at the moment are the two leaders. So Gary Rogers, who's not here this weekend to watch, he'll be watching from shore. And he'll be very happy with Moffat and McLaughlin at fourth and fifth position currently. And going well. McLaughlin was very impressive yesterday, especially with the problem after the pit stop. Even to finish the race without the work coming off was a great job to see them all run over this roller coaster. It's very fast, the run down the hill into turn four. Nice mid-corner performance through four and five, roughly 135k there. And then the reshaped section here at turn six, there used to be a little squiggle on the way into that corner. And now up and over Corporate Hill, Rusty. Just on the radio message there before from James Moffat about wanting a bit more turn in car 34. I've just gonna have a word to his crew here at uh, at Gary Rogers Volvo, they tell me they may, they're contemplating a ride height change in the first stop. Thanks, Rusty. And on that topic, uh, Van Gisbergen's looking for more front as well. I just heard him on the radio while you were talking, so uh, he's not happy with the balance in car number 97 for Red Bull. Well, he's been the real loser, hasn't he? He's gone from position two down to position six based on that start. And Lowndes has been the real winner. He's the man that's jumped three spots from P4 to P1. So there you go. There's the, the big, long field of cars running down in Turn 1. One of the best spots to watch race cars in Australia based on the fast entry into Turn 1 and the way the cars move around. 11 of the cars at the top of the field scape here are all in the 32. So already people are going to have to conserve tyres here and try and play these stops further down into the race. So at the moment, you've got to try and retain this weird balance between being racy with those that are around you, but at the same time not exciting the tyre too much and sliding the car at either end. But the lap times are telling us that they're already having to be very, very careful in how they treat the tyre. And you can see the way they're driving them, Neil. You watch the rear shot out of turn four to turn five. You watch the way the cars come off turn six. Very little oversteer. So take a particular note of the body language of the cars. So you watch even off the back of Corporate Hill there, normally the cars will slide around. We will see them in qualifying using everything up. And check the front wheel here. Have a look at the amount of distortion and then that front wheel on the left over the Vallelunga curb. This is what we've been speaking about the whole time, about how aggressive those curbs are. And look at the distortion, the load on the right front and right rear it almost feels at that stage like it's going to peel the tire off the rim those forces are so high it's an extraordinary corner it's one of the best corners because of its speed the varying grip the bump and the way that you have to flow the car so well off that corner you see all those different lines use every bit of the concrete apron on the outside because the concrete has got more grip than the tar so you aim the car for the concrete patch Someone's having quite a grizzle about their, their tyre and they reckon it's actually got a problem. And they didn't catch whose voice it was or which car number. 
fastest car on the last lap, by the way, was Craig Lowndes. And uh, here's Mark Winterbottom under assault now from uh, car number triple one, which is Chris Pither in the ice break racing entry. And it may have been car number one that I saw. I mean, actually, when you look at what's happening on screen there, in fact, they... Yeah, so there's something going on there with, with one of the key runners has got a tyre issue of some description. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether it's Pitha or whether or not it's Winterbottom. Let's see. So just looking at these sector splits and looking at lap speed, uh, it's, one, it's one, definitely, one. definitely one, isn't it? Yep. So that's the 50% piece. Once you've flat spotted a tyre like that, you just keep on catching it. Now the former teammates that were FPR running into each other down the straight. So his words were, and it wasn't, I couldn't recognise his voice, that I, it sounded like it had failed a chord in the tyre was what he was talking about. It had some sort of a tyre failure. Now he's parked up on oh. the wrong side of the traffic here, getting to the left will be and see what's going to happen is Dale's trying to race him down the left side. Man. And Frosty's trying to get to the pit lane. That was so close. That's like being in the wrong lane in the traffic, that one. He was on the right lane trying to get off the exit. So a tyre failure of some description, now whether that's caused by a kerb or a previous brake lock, or just a, a simple construction failure of that tyre. I'll try to find out for you. We saw it lock up very badly into turn eight. Winterbottom makes the first stop. Which this won't serve you well because it makes... That um, was way too long to react to a command to get the brake blinking out, wasn't it? So it had to be re-emphasised. So they're also seeing higher brake temps than uh, they may have been forecasting based on earlier runs. Here we go. This is Mark trying to get into the pit. There's Dale Wood. Now what's he do? He brakes and he finally crosses across and there's the entry road. So he was lucky to get away with that one. Very easy to keep on turning across. And there it is. There's the construction fire. You can see the... It's got a big blister down big the blister inside edge of the tyre. Wire hanging out of it too, so it's a more it's a action in one. the pit lane now. Van Gisbergen in and Tanders also coming in behind him in car number two. So this will be a change of strategy, no doubt, for Van Gisbergen based on where he is in the field to try and find a way to dig out. This is uh, our blue strategy that we put up in the Hino hub. See the board going out in the pit lane for Garth Tander so he can see. It's actually quite difficult in the cars sometimes to pick exactly where your crew are. It's alive with colour in there. And for Ben Gisbergen, it'll be how much change he can make to the car because it was clearly hurting him. The car wasn't good enough. And he would have said, I need some corrective surgery. To fix the balance. So you minimise the damage. If you hang out there for longer, another five laps of poor car balance, you go slow. So he's effectively decided that even though this might not be the right strategy in terms of tyre, it's the right strategy in terms of car balance. Yeah, boys, I just uh, I don't know if you got a good view of that tyre, but the entire edge, inside edge of Mark Winterbottom's tyre on the, from the right side there, you can see it on the TV net, the entire edge of it was destroyed. Uh, the, the, as you can see, the steel belts were hanging out of it. So that's a strange thing. It's not like it's a lock-up, is it? That's, that's a weird one, some sort of distortion maybe that's happened in that wheel or that tyre, but that's not, uh, from my estimations and what I saw of it, it doesn't look like it was a lock-up, it's something else. And Lowndes, Wind Cup and Pi all come to the lane. Thanks, Greg. And remember that all weekend, Frosty's been in search of turn. He's been particularly uncomfortable down at turn one with that car. So if they kept on trying to find ways to make some front grip, they may have ended up doing something with geometry that caused them some issues. Lots of ifs and buts around those questions. You spoke about the undercut. The guys immediately have responded to Van Gisberg and stopped. So unlike yesterday, straight in. Big change. Pit lane is all clear, correct? Pit lane is all 
cold soft tyres, cold soft tyres. Should be clear, should be clear on exit, clear on exit. So Lowndes, Wind Cup, High, Van Gisberg and Tanda, Winterbottom have all been into the lane now and in Frosty's case, for reasons that he'd prefer not to have to wander in and see the crew. Meantime, in the lead of the race, 2.9 second margin over James Moffat is Chaz Mostert. So that was a nice clean stop for Lowndes out of the lead of the race. And, uh, on our computer estimate, so sometimes we can just double check with a physical sight gauge check down in the lane, but we're thinking that they've put 60 litres in Craig Lowndes' car or very close to it. So Clowns we cover almost exactly the same amount of fuel based on that stop at the same time of the race. And now, what do these guys do? Clearly they don't want to be affected by hurting each other in the pit stop. They also don't want to lose too much based on the undercut that Triple Eight have now serviced all three of their cars. So if I was in that bunker now, you, you've probably got to bring at least one of these cars in very soon so you're not too far offset from the Triple Eight strategy. What does Mostert do? We said at the start of the race, there you go. There's a DRM Volvo pit stop ready for McLaughlin. And interesting to see what Mostert does because remember, he's got the most amount of new tyres of any car in pit lane. I should have added Dick Perkett's name to that list of stoppers before as well. So more people reacting now. We're going to see James Courtney in any tick of the clock. He's currently in sixth position. And just looking up and down the fuel added column at the moment, pretty much everybody's on the same strategy, give or take five litres. Very little difference across any of those that we've seen come in so far. And now Scott McLaughlin reacting. He's coming in out of third position. Very aggressive on that entry then as Will Davison now almost at uh, I heard, snail pace. I heard Will call before and all I heard was the yeah, just keep going, word mate, just fuel. Keep going, just keep going. It's a downhill roll now. It's a downhill roll. So all I heard him say was fuel. So I may have only heard a clipped part of the conversation, but that's a drama on what's already been a typical weekend. Done. Done. Here's Rick Kelly. Five seconds. Five seconds. Clear. Go, 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 go. You're on. Nice stop. Just got to try to get out now without being affected. Oh, now, I think they're going to be fine go, go, go. with this now. Right well done. Oh, a little bubble. This is all. So that hurt on the exit. There's three or four second loss on the exit of the pit. Murph? Yeah, just uh, that update on, you can see him coming in very, very slowly, Will Davison. Uh, he's actually out of fuel, so that car is empty, and it's obviously, he's pulled over to the right-hand side, sorry, to the left now, because he cannot get any further. The team is running down there to bring him in, so uh, that is a, seems like an incredibly bad miscalculation there. I'll just ca try and catch Jeff Slater and see if there was some other issue. Murph, just in between time, I've gone to Nissan because uh, Scott Sinclair was observing a few laps ago when we were following Rick Kelly that he wasn't hitting the apexes with that car and they felt as though he was suffering from some understeer or push, but the team tell me they did not make a change to that car in the stop. Thanks, boys. That's heartbreak for Techno Autosports and Darrell Lee Sticks having to push that car all the way back down the lane. So they've... Uh, either got a pickup issue which is unlikely or they've just under fueled it in the first didn't run it too long we were talking about starting fuel in the order of 45 litres if you use our 3.12 per lap plus we had a false start there's a reconnaissance and a formation lap and an extra formation lap they've, they've run it a lap too long so on the 3.12 with the numbers that we've completed so far it's about 38 odd litres and the rest of it wasn't enough We've got another 10 seconds there, another 10 seconds. Pit lane is all clear when you drop, Will. Clear at the front wide here, we've got five seconds, Will. I'm trying to start it. You restart yeah. it, mate, you restart it. So you're clear to go on your drop, you've got a bit of traffic now, mate. 
a little bit of while to prime oh, the to go. Behind seven, behind seven, behind seven. Yeah, boys, so uh, as you can see, he's just trying to fire it up now, get some fuel through the pumps, get some pressure into the, the feed system, and it's still just working away there, getting pressure for Will Davidson. I just spoke to Jeff Slater, his hands, well, his head was in his hands. He just said not enough fuel was put in the car, so his expectation was very different to what actually they had in there, so it was an error uh, by the team there on how much fuel went in Will Davidson's car for the start of the race. And it, it sounds simple, but sometimes those fundamentals can be tricky. And the teams deal with their fuel in terms of weight. So the volume of fuel that you get varies with the temperature. It affects the specific gravity of the fuel, so they, uh, they measure the fuel by weight. I'm just holding my breath a little bit watching this exchange here. It's a bit distracting, so we'll focus on that now. Todd Kelly and Nick Perkett. And you can see rubber build-up on the edges of the racetrack at the moment as well. So as some of the tyre sets get near the end of their life, they're beginning to really hurt. Lap speeds have dropped. Moffat, for example, last lap was in the 30, high 33s and 34s. Our peak speed in the race was 30.9. So I get the sense, might be wrong, but it is warmer today. I get the sense, I'll get some numbers on this, that it is slower today and I reckon potentially hurting the tyres even more. I agree, and I think the wind direction actually hurts critically. It's a crosswind which becomes a headwind as you turn into turn one. So I think in the high speed section, you lose some front accuracy. There's Courtney now about to rejoin. He was right in behind Rick Kelly. He's now a long way behind Rick Kelly because we saw him go by. And we've also saw Winterbottom in front of Rick Kelly there. So here we go. This sideways exit gets out without getting caught. I thought he was going to be caught there with Nick Perka, but he's not. Now, I mentioned before that the, most of those that had stopped in that early phase were all pretty much on the same strategy, and give or take. They put 60 odd litres of fuel in the cars. We look at the race leader, Chas Mostert, having his run in. I'll get the point out quickly. Uh, Lowndes took on a little bit more. Oh, uh, uh, correction. Um, Courtney took on a little bit more fuel than some of the others that we've seen, about 10 odd litres or more than others that we've been talking about. And there's a couple of others, but I want to focus on this stop of Mostert's here and not get carried away with the numbers. I'll come back to it. Stop perfectly on the marks, the young bloke says. Waiting for fuel, plenty of time. You're going to have a clear exit there, Chazzy boy. You've got water coming down. Need to be careful here, careful. Oh. So good communication there in the end. I thought that was going to be an exit, which was going to have the two team cars run into each other. They got away with that one. And there's the difference in the undercut. So must it remember in the early phase of the race was second to Craig Lowndes. When this settles down, we'll give you the real numbers, but he has dropped back a long, long way. But remember, it becomes shorter distant stints and also less fuel. Give you a number soon on the numbers of fuel. What do you got there? I'll, I'll come back to the, those, but uh, I mentioned that several prominent guys took on more fuel. Courtney took on about 70 plus litres. Davey Reynolds took on about 80 plus. Whereas that crop of cars that came in initially were all in the 60 range. And looking at uh, Mostert on screen, they put about 60 odd litres in him, 60 to 65 litres. So he's pretty much in step with the others as we look at James Moffat. Yeah, boys, I just, boys, I just uh, put the uh, United uh, ruler up against Chaz Mostert's rig there, and he's uh, managed to get 72 litres into the 55. Now, now James Moffat's come in for his stop. A little earlier, we reported that he had uh, the possible ride height change they were contemplating for this car. They have opted not to do that, and they are telling James, this is a long stop for him here, they're telling him to tune the car on the run with the bars. And also, boys, just on your point before about tyre life today, and is it worse than Saturday, Richard Holway here in, at Volvo has just said to me something, hey, what if people were using worse quality rubber to start the race, but the better stuff is yet to come. Maybe that's a factor in that story. Yeah, it could be. Rusty, that's actually a good point. I'm, I'm just not sure why you would do that because you would have used two full sets yesterday and you've still got three sets for today. So for two stops, three stints, you should have enough tyres. The guy, as I said earlier, who's got the best tyres 
was Mostert, who only had, well, he had one less running qualifying effectively, but he also saved two rears. So six fresh tyres for Mostert. A pretty heavy battle here. These guys made contact yesterday. Moffat and Winterbottom. They're currently ninth and tenth. The only car that hasn't stopped at the moment is Chris Pither. Lowndes is the effective race leader from Wink Cup and Van Gisbergen, as you see. Rick Kelly dive down the inside of turn six, gets that done. Winner bottom right up in behind, doesn't get much closer than that. So um, a little sneaky computer program tells us that Mostert got 66, but the mark, uh, the correction, the Greg Murphy Mark 1 eyeball, which I'll trust all day long, um, it's saying exactly 72. So, uh, so a little bit more fuel for Mostert than some of the others that he's racing. Those few litres can be really handy now when you get to the next part of the stopping sequence, when they do stop number two. He'll be stationary for just a little less time. Well, he's effectively got 50 litres versus 60 litres, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. So he's got 10 litres less to put in, but remember, again, I keep saying it, he's also got green tyres at that stage. So has Jamie Winkup. He's got one set of green tyres. So Winkup and Boston, probably the best in terms of tyre condition. Slightly less time for Chaz in terms of fuel. So now Pither is in. So now Lowndes and Winkup Ben Gisbergen. Tander's been pretty good in that. We just need to sort out what Tander put in. 51 litres, so he's a bit, the a other bit way. less. Yeah, so they're trying to get him up in the game, and he is up there at the moment. And they've done that by a little short fuel, about 10 litres less than some of the others on average. Good exchange going on here at the moment. Cam Waters in the Monster Energy Ford Falcon, Preston Hire, Holden Commodore of Carl Reindler, and Michael Caruso in the Nissan Altima for Nissan Financial Services. Looking down the inside, couldn't get it done. So it's Lowndes, Wind Cup, Van Gisbergen, one, two, three at the moment. Two and a half seconds covers those cars as Michael sneaks up the inside of Carl. Then Volvo, correction, Tander, then Volvo, Scotty McLaughlin, Mostert, High, Moffat, Rick Kelly. On it goes here, back down the inside goes Carl. We're going to go down to the pits in a tick. We'll just see whether this resolves cleanly. Uh, Winterbottom, by the way, out of sequence somewhat, but just inside the top ten in that tenth position. Murph? Yeah, just with uh, Tim Edwards quickly. Mate, it's been some very good management so far uh, for the 55. Obviously, it started in qualifying. When Chaz got out of the car, he's got six sets of, uh, sorry, six brand new tyres. Still got a green set to put on. You've uh, put some more fuel in as well. Got a couple of seconds up your sleeve on the guys in front. So far, going very, very well. Yeah, we've well, done a pretty good summary there. You don't have to say much, do you? Not really. Uh, yes, he has got a little bit more fuel than other people, and obviously he's got fresh tyres. So we're really trying to run our own race. We're not getting to drawn into getting sucked into the pit lane when other people come in. You know, we know the de degradation is high here. So try and break it up, give him kind of three semi-equal stints on the tyres, and there we go. Now, uh, as far as uh, communication with Red Wichison on the, on the way the car is performing, he's pretty happy with that at the moment. Oh, look, Chaz has said bugger all. Yeah, so. which is normal. Yeah, exactly. So... Yeah, he's trucking along all right, so we'll just assume everything's all right. Did you also, have you had a chance to look at uh, the, the, wheel, the tire that came off Mark Winterbottom's car? Obviously, quite a lot of damage on the inside of that tire. Um, any, issue, any sort of idea of what happened? Uh, it's broken a cord, yeah. so, you know, that could have been from going over the back of the curbs or something like that, you know, in the first lap or yeah. so of the race. You know, you can um, overload it, but, yeah, it was a cord failure. Okay. And Scaifey, you got something? Yeah, Murph, just, can you just find out whether two of those tyres went on? He had six new tyres. Yep. Where did he put those two new ones just then? Uh, Scaifey's just asking, how did you structure that pit stop with the tyres you had? Where did the two greens go, do you know? <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't know. I'll try and find that one out for you, though, you mate. Look at the front of the garage and see what's lined up. Righto. <laughs> Go and have a look. <laughs> and if he did know, he's probably not going to tell you anyway. Just... Well, but just be interesting now, because if he put them down the loaded side of the car or he put two fresh tyres across the back, yeah. so he, he's had six new tyres. He's got to use those two tyres in that stop that we've just seen. And then he's got four new tyres to put on for the last segment. Well, he's got it working now because he's just driven straight down the inside of Scott McLaughlin pretty easily. Scotty got loose in the middle of turn one. Chaz was able to drive straight underneath him, and that's for position number five. Tander's next, and you can see where Garth is. To quantify the actual difference in hand, fuel in hand, that Mostert's got. In simple terms, he's three seconds better off than the blokes he's racing. So that's... Uh, McLaughlin in the background. I think you're corresponding with his boss. Gary Rogers is texting me. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> he said he's he's sitting on the couch with a Coopers enjoying it. <laughs> G'day, guys. Uh, 0.8 of a second is the gap between Craig Lance and Jamie. I thought we were going to hit us with something. In Thanks for the non-contribution, Gary, but the sponsor plug was handy. We were looking for a bit of technical chat. So just on a second now between Lowndes and Wind Cup, but this is a great battle. You've got grip in hand here, so I reckon that's answering your question at the moment, Scafie, about Chaz Mostert, because he's giving Garth Tander something to think about at the moment at the eastern end of the racetrack. Look how shallow he can park the car compared to those that he's racing. That's two cars in a lap that he's just been able to put the car precisely where he wants to put it, and off he goes. And Mostert's quick. Look at Garth's on the charge. Brand new car for him. He's actually got a run on him. So uh, he'll get that spot back in the run to one. And you don't want to be on the outside down here at turn one. There's no grip. Garth's thing just jumps sideways a little in the middle of the corner. And we'll see whether the extra tyre grip helps under brakes here. Well, it does. Garth's going to run very high in the mid corner because he threw it down there under brakes. He's going to hold station, though, when they get through the right-hander at turn three. Great exchange between these guys. Garth Tander and Chaz Mostert at it. Turn four. The problem is it holds both of them up. Both use your tyres, hard to do exactly what they've just done. He's down the inside now. Got him. But Garth will be a bit inspired. He's had such a rotten run for much of the year. A bit of grip will be... That frightened me for a minute when I looked at Leanne, but I thought maybe she changed her hair too since I last saw her. <laughs> Stop it. It's OK, I know her very well. I can say that. Well, I could have stepped back then. I was a little bit frightened. The commentary box. <laughs> it's a jacket. Oh, dear. I, I've been, it's OK. I've, I've been hiring her to do some driving work for us. We're OK. <laughs> so she <laughs> Leanne will be very happy with the performance of her husband. She's not going to be very happy with me. <laughs> All right, let's straighten up. Here we go. This is the big moment for Scotty McLaughlin. It had a real tank slapper. He was right out sideways. He gathered it up, but he ended up out in the Volga. And you can see here down at Turn 1, it's very fast. It's a great corner. 215k mid-corner speed. And... As you can see there now, you can check the Mostert car position versus Tanda. And McLaughlin was putting some pressure on Tanda before this, so Mostert now has escaped them. It'll be interesting to see whether they put those new, or the two of the four tyres down the loaded side or on the rear of Mostert's car. As we go back and have a look at this battle with Dar Wood, Chris Pither, just up in front. Nick Perkat. So this is a pretty lively exchange and they're battling at the moment for 14th, 15th and 16th. Lowndes leads from Wink Up, Van Gisbergen, Mostert, Tander, McLaughlin, Moffat, Pye, Rick Kelly, Fabian Coulthard. Cast your mind back to the Hino Hub race facts presentation just pre-race as we look at Pitha down the inside of Dale Wood here. It's nearly there and have a decent run through this next left-hander but Dale's going to stay out there because if he can hang to the inside for the right-hander at the hairpin he's still have right away and he's done that um Mostert just going back to race strategy he's very much on that even tire green strategy that we explained and that's what Tim was reiterating these guys are going to go on with this all the way to the top end of the circuit and still it goes now for Chris he's in no man's land on the outside of turn 10 he tries to sneak it up the inside Dale wakes up to that one, covers him. Chris is going to get a better run here. He's shallower on the exit. Here we go. This has been like three quarters of a lap alongside each other. Great exchange between both guys, though. It's uh, Chris Pither that prevails for the moment. Let's see what happens at the other side of turn one. And the other guys, just going back to a clumsy strategy point here, that stopped the, the better guys that we made reference to who stopped early in the sequence they're much more on the blue strategy so but the lines will meet up here at this second and final stop will anybody be brave for a three-stopper will the safety car lob james moffat down the inside now of garth tander and i heard scott mclaughlin on the radio sounded pretty frustrated with himself too because i think there was another little error down there at turn one after the replay moment that we saw There's scotty in the background 
Lowndes is almost one second over Wing Cup. No one's breaking any lap records at the moment because they're all in tyre conservation mode to get to the next stop where they'll put their best tyres on. And good job, Craig. Good job. Nice work. Ludo is just encouraging Craig. So is Richard Holway on Scott McLaughlin. I also just spotted out the window too, Scafie. There's a bit more cloud cover than there was earlier, certainly towards the uh, northwestern and western horizon. It's okay at the eastern end of the racetrack, but there is a little bit more out there at the moment. So uh, that will also change the behaviour of these cars and the way in which the tyres are wearing as we focus now on Coulthard on Rick Kelly at turn two. Now, Coulthard now is on the wrong side of the road try to do the crisscross he's going to turn right back the other side and he's pretty much got that maneuver done he's got to get down here now and that's a nice move and what he did the clever part of this is when you've made that move you've got to dive in there hard which actually pushes the guy on the left too wide there's no use getting in there and being a gentleman because you, the guy then becomes the man who is on the inside for turn five so you've got to make sure if you're going to get that manoeuvre made cleanly that it's got to be aggressive and that was very nice from Fabian down the inside of Rick Kelly. So we're well past the critical lap that we often talk about in these longer fuel races and that's not a factor. What it's all about now is choosing the right moment to make your final stop and we're beginning to get into the range where that's going to start happening. Somewhere between now and the next three or four laps is what the standard predictions show. But depending on the way in which your car's behaving, a bit of extra cloud cover, a little tweak of the car at the end of the first stop, you might try and play that as long as you can. Now, yesterday, there was a, quite a substantial difference between the way in which they played it with the Red Bull cars, between Jamie Wincup and Shane Van Gisbergen. And, and the view was that, your view was that if they put Jamie on something more like Shane's strategy, he wouldn't have had to fight so hard, but he did make massive ground on those younger tyres, and there were three laps difference between the tyre sets. So as few as basically 12 kilometres on these tyres, as evidenced yesterday, will make a difference to lap speed performance and the way the strategy plays. So we're at the juicy part of the race now. We're on board with Rick Kelly. You see that slide, and this is the move that we were commenting on. Down the inside, what a great shot out of the driver's side window, looking back at Fabian. And now looking across from Rick's perspective, Fabian down the inside there at turn four. And a really good exchange. In fact, Scott Pye's now taken a lot of ground. He's rounded up from in behind Scott Pye. Here he is. He's got Rick Kelly. And he's right up in behind Fabian Coulthard. So these guys are having a pretty healthy battle in the DJR 10 Penske Falcons. Scafi, as you know, a lot of teams are pretty guarded about what they've got in terms of tyres for the rest of this race. He's a brand spanking, shiny new pair for uh, Team 18 there. Now, they're going to put them on the rear of the car for Carl Reinler. Only rear tyres for him. And I'm hearing from LDM Motorsport that Andre Heimgartner is only going to put two brand new ones down the right-hand side on his car. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. And, and what that does is if you put the two new tyres on the rear, you've got to make some sort of chassis adjustment because it builds too much understeer. You've got too much rear grip and it hurts the front tyre. Conversely, if you put them down the loaded side, then, then it's not as linear. It tends to tram track under brakes for a couple of laps until the tyre's normalised. So there's a couple of different theories. This is very much load sensitive on the right-hand side of the car. Normally, you get a better yield from a new front right and a new right rear. David Couchy, engineer for Jamie Wincup's just told him not long now on this tyre set. Stretch them as far as you can, but any tick they'll bring car number 88 in. We've got 26 laps remaining. Michael Caruso was the fastest car on the last lap, so they're talking Michael up to press on as hard as he can. As you said, we're just getting to this critical phase. And what tyres everyone finally puts on. For sure, we know that Mostert's got four, so is Wink Cup. And I reckon the Triple Eight guys are pretty much running together in terms of outright pace. On the previous lap, they were all within one tenth of a second. So they're almost coaxing each other along in terms of their pace. Good battle between the brothers Kelly here at the moment. So Rick and Todd are in tenth and eleventh. And they've got a spirited battle going with Scotty Pipe. Rick 
was a bit critical at the end of yesterday's race that they didn't have the car tuned up well enough. But remember, he lost a huge chunk of time on Friday to a sticky throttle with this single-head Nissan Altima. Here we are back on board with him on the run down to one. That's what the back of the Falcon looks like. And high-speed push is the big complaint from McLaughlin. I just yep. heard him in great detail describing to Richard Holway what his issues are. And I'm sure they'll try and rectify that in this final stop. And remember that Scotty at the moment is in seventh position. He's 12 seconds from the lead. Good mid-corner behaviour in that Nissan Altima. It's nice in through the middle of turn two there. See the way that he sacrifices the end of turn two so he doesn't use all the road on the way out of the corner. Scott Pye uses all the road on the way out of there. This is close to being a little contact there with Tanda and McLaughlin. He was almost down the inside at turn five. Some of his push will be coming from the disturbed air that Garth's car is generating as well. It'll be gulping down hot air in the front of the Volvo. He's up the inside of him now through the left-hander at seven. Has he got him? Garth's a seasoned campaigner. He knows that if he holds position here, even if he's in an awkward race line, he'll make life difficult for McLaughlin, and he has. And then taking advantage of all this is Coulthard. Now it's going to be three wide in the run up to the eastern end of the circuit. Scott McLaughlin wasn't very complimentary there over the radio. And you've got to, when you... In racing Garth, you've got to be absolutely alongside him. And he just now slithers his way onto the main straight, pulling gears, trying to minimise the wheel spin. Right there, mate. Let's see what you can do, mate. We need a couple of good ones here. So Richard Holway is engineer, Scott McLaughlin. But that was a big free kick for Fabian Coulthard. Look at the distance that he's made while that scuffle was going on. We're on board with Tanda to turn two. to wait a long time for the front of the nose. That car to settle through turn two, Tander. You can hear him just waiting, pulling on steering lock. There's a lot of mid-corner push with that car then. What about the ground Mostert's made on Champion Gisbergen, Neil? That's a big gain over the last three or four laps. It was second fastest on the last lap. Van Gisbergen, by contrast, was eighth fastest in this car, tyres in hand, and they're committed to that even tyre strategy, which is starting to pay a dividend for them in this, the back end now, this stint on this tyre set, Murph. Yeah, I'll just uh, grab a synopsis of DJR Team Pinsky's performance so far, Dr. Ryan's story. Uh, Scotty Pye just looks like he's dropped off the pace there a little bit. Uh, any issues there? No, no, I think he's just uh, getting to the end of the end of the tyre life there. He's into second phase and struggling a little bit. I think we'll bring him in shortly. It was a nice move uh, there with Fabian Coulthard grabbing a couple of spots there. Did a nice job of uh, clearing those two guys. As, uh, as, as Phil, Phil turned around and uh, said to me, that's vintage, vintage fabulous there. So uh, I'll take his word for it. What's your condition uh, for the last run of the finish as far as tyres go? Well, Scott's in a good position as a result of, uh, unfortunately, not finishing the race yesterday. He's got a decent set of tyres there if there's a late safety car. So it's a bit of an, an ace in the hole if it comes to that. But uh, we're, we're, we're in a reasonable position. Seems like Fabian's car has improved a bit from yesterday. He must be a bit happy with the way things are going. Obviously, it's trucking along nicely at the moment. Yeah, it's doing pretty well at the moment. Both cars are very similar in terms of where they are now with setup, so we're, we're, we're happy with that. Just disappointed that Scott's losing a bit of track position at the moment. Thanks for the update, cheers. Thanks, cheers. So Todd Kelly's in the lane, as you can see in the car sales, Nissan Altima, and he's jumped out from under the back of his brother's car. So he's the first of those that we're seeing now make this second stop from just outside the top ten. Fabian was the fastest car on the last lap, followed by Mostert. It's going to be about damage go, 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 go. limitation this weekend for Mark Winterbottom. Check These guys this are out. tightening up the margin here, yeah. big time at the moment as well. So Lowndes and Wind Cup, this is the battle for the lead of the race at the moment. One's enjoying his 600th race, and he made quite a mistake there at turn 10, Lowndes. It bounced awkwardly over the kerb, ran wide. Jamie's on him. He's got a little bit better exit. One kilometre an hour corner exit speed. Makes a difference. And there was a pit call for 88. Might have missed that. He's, he's, he missed that. He's missed it. Yeah, pit, pit was the call from Dave Couchy. Yeah, he missed that. Which, at that point, was a critical one. So I thought at that stage, as soon as he said that, he was coming straight in. As it turned out, he hung there. 
it, yeah, that was uh, maybe a little bit of an error there, but definitely because the crew are in the pit lane waiting. So that call might have come a little bit late from David Couch. He, we'll have to see how that plays out because is he going to get held up on this lap by Craig Lowndes? Here we go, Mostert. This is opposite now to yesterday. Then Gisberg has got Mostert right there. As we see, Scott McLaughlin now being serviced. Well, Actually, I'm waiting on fuel. Five seconds, same five seconds. Two lanes clear at the moment. Mostert's probably Good better go. off to go and put those four new tyres on go, pretty, go, go. pretty soon. Go, go, go. And this was intriguing battle yesterday that we saw Van Gisberg and, and Winkup now Winkup draw your front bar at seven please draw your front bar at seven <laughs> now, he's not telling him to come in now he's saying to tune the front bar go up to seven now Mostert is 5.9 seconds from the lead of the race and we know he's got a three second fuel advantage on most of these guys that he's racing Remember the, uh, oh, there you go. A little bit of Caltex on Caltex action there. It certainly was. And he was too close to actually get a really big gain. Check this out. Here we go. Boom. Very close, man. Hey, just, uh, just to confirm on what tyres are going on each of these cars, Craig Lowndes has two greens that are going to go on the right-hand side. And Jamie Wickup, as we know, just can confirm, has got four green Dunlops to go on his car. So they come in together. This is going to maybe just hurt. Oh, man, he was close, Jamie Wickup, to that wheel of Craig Lowndes. But he did a very good job to get in nice and straight. The refuel was on in very quickly. And it's a race to get out of the lane. Four green tyres are going to be pretty handy things to have for the back end of this race. Thanks for the update, Greg. Meantime, right-hand corner of screen. Look at this battle. Van Gisbergen at it with Mostert. Oh, look at Lowndes and Winkup. They're going to go side to side on the pit lane exit. And Lowndes actually slithered off the edge of the road in the grass. So Winkup has nabbed him. Meantime, round the back of the hill. It is on between Mostert and Van Gisbergen. They were alongside each other. We come out of the stops and we saw Van Gisbergen down the inside of the six to go over. Corporate Hill, Mostert prevails as they get to the other end of the circuit, which it'll be interesting to see. Now, here we go. We're going to have a stop. No, Are they both going to stop? Yeah, yeah they both yeah. will. Be a gain here for Van Gisbergen in the entry phase, but a gain for Mostert. Uh, James Moffat in the Volvo goes to the lead in the Wilson Security S60. Hey boys, just uh, as we did with the last two guys, here comes Chaz Mostert and Shane Van Gisbergen. They've got two green tyres for Mostert on the back. I think the ones at the front, they, they are very lightly roaded. And for Shane Van Gisbergen, he had three runs in qualifying, so no green tyres for him. But Mostert, three seconds less fuel to put in this car. So he should very easily come out ahead of that Shane Van Gisbergen. Yeah, that's a great update. Thanks for that, Murph. We know now exactly the fuel and tyre scenario. Remember, they've been undercut by these two. Yep. That's the result of the undercut. Wind Cup, Lowndes, lost it, and here comes Shane Van Gisbergen. 20 laps remaining. So we're set for a fantastic battle. Mostert and Winkup with new tyres. The man who was probably the fastest guy yesterday but couldn't get by his teammate is currently leading. This may be his 100th win today for Jamie Winkup. In behind, check this out, it's Craig Lowndes in his 600th start. Yeah, this is so close. And then he got sideways. When he flicked the pit lane speed limiter off, it dropped the right rear onto the grass as well. Meantime, on the other end of the racetrack, these fellas were at it. Van Gisbergen and Mostert. This is the right-hander at turn four. Moffat's the leader from Coulthard, Courtney, Pither, Waters, Slade. 
look at this for an exchange. Van Gisbergen back down the inside now at turn seven. Correction turn six. Really cool racing between these two. Great respect between them. Intense motor racing, but nothing inappropriate. No pushing and shoving. And there's a lot of categories could take a lesson from this. Yeah, it's world-class stuff, isn't it? Great driving. We've seen them do this now three or four times this season. We also saw them do it last year at Ipswich. It's just fantastic when they turn it on. They can park the cars wherever they like. They don't make contact. A lot of respect between them and really great quality driving from both of these guys. And this young man, James Moffat, who currently leads with a 4.66 second gap over Coulthard. And we're now in gamesmanship land as to when Moffat pits and what happens with Fabian Coulthard and James Courtney because they're second and third on track at the moment. Stays out. On his current numbers, he's going to be coming out there or thereabouts with Chas Mostert. But they're stretching him at the moment. Manuel Sanchez is his engineer. And the longer that he can keep playing, provided he's not leeching too much lap speed and the younger the tyres that he has to play with for the final stint in this race. We saw a great advantage yesterday played in lap speed by Win Cup. Three laps difference was the age of the tyres. He had a tonne of speed, but he didn't have track position. So where they've got to be careful. In this squad, is not giving away track position because you know you're going to get a gain from the grip. He's caught me. Nice connection there. The car was hardly stopped. The gun went straight on. Beautiful work by whoever's on the right front corner. That car was just on it. That was perfect. Well rehearsed, well executed. All clear, mate. Go, go. Nice stop. Very nice stop. With the news regarding HRT, this team have galvanised themselves. Working very hard this weekend to be not just faster on track, but that stop is a great example of the teamwork there. On our trend lines here now, James Moffat, I reckon, is could end up tangling behind Van Gisberg, and he might even be vulnerable to Scott McLaughlin. So staying out the extra lap here at the moment is not playing well for him. Well, this is exactly the same scenario as Wing Cup yesterday. Here we go. Courtney being attacked by Scott Pye. This is turn four. Courtney will try to hold out there. He can't quite do it on new, fresh tyres. Fabian Coulthard's come in in the other MAN, Dick Johnson Racing Team Penske. That's himself. smart. That's smart. Yeah. It's going to be the undercut effectively on Moffat. He was 4.66 seconds at that stage. So if you think you're going to get a second and a half, maybe two seconds, just have a look at what fuel he had to put on versus... Uh, it's basically the same, seven, oh, yeah, basically the same amount of fuel they've got. The and lead here game. he is now. Incidentally, Mostert is fastest on the racetrack. Moffat's the leader from Pitha and Slade, and then the first that's done the two stops is Wind Cup, then Lowndes, then Mostert. And the rest of the field are all slipping back into order now as they process their second and final stop of the race. Coulthard rejoins just in front of Tanda. That's Garth through turn two, the Holden Racing Team Commodore. Just, this is exactly the same as Wind Cup yesterday. He's got to come in. I'm just using or losing too much time and using those tyres up. Yeah, he's in now. Right, finally. Yeah, that last lap, the last two laps, but particularly the last lap have really hurt. You see him grab the pit lane speed limiter there. 40 k's, let's go to Greg. Crompo, I ran the United Fuel rule over uh, what James Moffat put in at the last stop. 62 litres. He obviously needs 58 here. So he'll be stationary in the order of just under 16 seconds. I've also had a word to Dunlop Motorsport because you guys were worried about that little bit of cloud cover, that break in the sunlight on the track before. And the track temperature has dropped from 33 to 27, they tell me. Good intel, thanks Rusty. So that'll make a difference. That'll actually help the tyres. Wheels are done, waiting on fuel. Five seconds, five seconds. What's seconds. going on there? Clear. Just just really go, go, go. Good job. There's a 
lot of fuel. It's a very strange one. I'm trying to follow that for you. Was it fuel? It may not have been fuel. It could have been water. Mm. But so Pither's yet to stop. And, and once Chris has come into the uh, ice break entry and cleared that final stop, it leaves Wing Cup in the lead. Then the games get played. We'll see who's got pace, who's looking after tyres. 16 laps remaining. That has been confirmed in the pit lane as uh, water, because they've uh, topped up some water. Didn't look good though, did it? Underneath the car. There's James set sail with a big birthday grip now, and uh, that extra grip will be used to great advantage for him. So that air gap that he's got behind Scott McLaughlin will disappear pretty quickly when he gets those tyres up to temperature and pressure, but he has given away a lot of track position waiting that extra couple of laps. How's the build-up? How's the yeah. amount? I've never seen marbles that big on the exit. Some of them are waffles too. Time, they're, they? they're not marbles, they're basketballs, some of them. Well, that was what the tyre smoke was for Wing Cup yesterday, because he ran over one of those. A big chunk of rubber was in next to the brake duct that was actually rubbing. So when we thought there was something wrong with the tyre yesterday of Jamie Wink up at the end of the race, it was only a big piece of rubber that was jammed in the inner guard. Chris Pith has now come in, so that's the final of those to process through this second stop. This is Caruso right up in behind Courtney. So Wink up will assume the lead from Craig Lowndes, Chas Mostert, Shane Van Gisbergen, Scott McLaughlin, James Moffat, Fabian Coulthard, Garth Tander, Todd Kelly has done a good job, Rick Kelly, James Courtney, Michael Caruso, you can see on screen there. So, a sprint home. Not really a sprint when it hurts the tyres so much, but it's about how you can use the tyre to its maximum see what the last four or five laps yield in terms of how you've done that versus other guys. This is the battle between David Reynolds and Jason Bright. Bright took on a big pile of fuel in that first stop. But uh, they're down the order at the moment and uh, Tim Slade not too far away. So Slade is 16, Bright 17, Reynolds 18. So I just haven't been able to crack the code at Brad Jones Racing this weekend. and. I spoke to David Reynolds just prior to the start of the race and, he just, just, and Barry Ryan is kind of frustrated that he didn't have an answer for a car set up and that can happen at this racetrack. Just on that note, Crompo, I bailed him up. I heard you talking about him, so I wanted to get an update on how things were going today. Uh, not in terms of race position right now, but general car performance. Any better than yesterday? Uh, it's, it's a little bit better, but yeah, we just tried a few more things and it didn't work today. Usually we get it right on Sunday, we just haven't quite got it right, so yeah, we struggled in qualifying and we've tried a few more things in the race, but maybe for next year we've got a bit more up our sleeves now, so yeah, that's about it. Look ahead to the Enduros, good combo, particularly David Reynolds and Craig there together. Yeah, it's very exciting, yeah. I think we're pretty confident with a low, low grip track like Sandown and then Bathurst, we're pretty confident we'll get that right, so yeah, Gold Coast, sort of like Townsville, so I think we're pretty set there, so yeah, pretty excited. Motorsport, and this is Shay Davies who's running in that second car of theirs this weekend uh, with Westfield and the Super Center on either side of that car, so different livery either side. And Shay stepped out of the Dunlop series and he will now complete the balance of the year with Erebus in these newer generation supercars. He's been an Australian Kumo V8 Touring Car champion, had great success also for quite a long period of time in Carrera Cup mighty excited about the prospect of joining the ranks of these drivers yesterday and so he's a career race number two in a supercar Craig Lance 600 <laughs> a great story but drove very well um, got a bit excited yesterday in the first five laps of the race and used a bit too much of the tire by his own admission it takes a long time to understand the very different rhythm in this category to pretty much any other so we're with Mostert he's third at the moment and on the last lap, he was the third fastest. Lowndes was second fastest. Our race leader, Jamie Winkup, was seventh fastest. The fastest bloke in the, on the racetrack out there was actually James Moffat in the Volvo. 13 laps remain. And that's a, a real margin that we're looking at there between Mostert and the back of Craig Lowndes. So that's how far he is from second place. And there's the leader right at the second apex of turn two. So this is the scenario. And of those cars on that last lap that we're looking at, 
of the three that we just focused on, Wind Cup was the best. <laughs> How's that? Rick Kelly was going to was going to find out the inside of his brother then at 270 kilometres an hour. There wasn't much in it down there, was there? It was very close. We've seen some great battles between the two brothers over the years. They've got a wonderful relationship co-owning this race team. They work very hard. They race very hard, have done for a long period of time, but um, they probably both have a picture of Richard Emery above them at the moment in their thoughts, thinking we better not actually go on with that one because Richard, the chief executive of the Nissan Motor Company, is here this weekend. Yeah, that was always going to end badly. Uh, there you go, go, on cue. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely on cue. Uh, you're right there, Crombo. I'm with Richard Emery, MD of uh, Nissan Australia. Mate, good to see you here, just watching the two brothers go at it out there in their Ultimas. Yeah, I think I'd rather talk to you than watch the TV at the moment. Well, you are. You're actually not <laughs> facing the TV. <laughs> Is that on purpose? Probably. Yeah. Hey, uh, everything, uh, these boys are doing a fantastic job out there again, though. Obviously, uh, Todd, uh, he's found a little resurgence today after yesterday's performance to, to be up the front there. Yeah, look, absolutely. Our race pace has been there for the last couple of months. We've just got to qualify a bit better because we uh, we can see when we get into the race uh, you know we're thereabouts it's such a challenge and i mean the, the investment that goes into this to to find those tiny little one percenters it's uh, never ending yeah, every race we come to it's so close on qualifying so it is those little bits that we need to and uh, we need to chase well uh, turn around and watch the tv and enjoy the rest of it thanks for right. being here thank you always important at this phase of the race to get a report card on how our commentary is going and critiquing us in recent races has been the injured Lee Holdsworth. Are things sounding better today? Not bad, mate. Getting better. B plus. B, I B plus. <laughs> we're, we're happy with that. Now, Spirit thought, in all seriousness, for the frustration in this pit lane, a lot of co-drivers can't wait to get behind the wheel of the cars tomorrow with some hot laps, and you're just as eager to get back behind the wheel too, aren't you? Yeah, usually for a ride day, you get your co-driver, you throw him in and say, you do the whole job, but um, tomorrow I'm pretty keen to jump in and just get back behind the wheel and uh, feel this new car because it's looking pretty good at the moment. All right, now I've been told by our director to turn your attention to the screen here. We're going to watch a, a little something. This might be the, the race feed, so I might have to describe it uh, on the run. So, I mean, we're really excited for you to... to here we go. Let's have a look here. So, Carl Reindler to the right. Oh, oh, call this. Come on. <laughs> Honesty. I don't know. Are they mates? It doesn't look like it, does it? I don't know what's going on there. Uh, looks like what Tanda usually does. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Bit of bit of bump and uh, bit of bit, bit of bump and grind. It's all a part of racing, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. Hey, enjoy the enduros. We can't wait to see you at the Sandown 500. Yeah, cheers. I can't wait to be there. Thank you. I reckon that caught him by surprise, Lee Holdsworth. When you look at his brand new car being driven by Carl Ryan, Look, Cam Waters on the left in the monster car, and they're monstering each other. Those two in a straight line at 270 kilometres an hour. Don't forget those. Pertec Enduro Cup races coming up at Sandown, at Bathurst and at the Gold Coast. And if you buy your tickets for Bathurst before the 31st of August, there will be a trophy lanyard coming your way. Tickettech.com.au. Going to be a couple of very big events in our next broadcast. Austin speed advantage just starting to subside now versus Lowndes and Wink Cup. It was slightly slower. The fastest two cars on that lap were in fifth and sixth. Fabian Coulthard and James Moffat were the two fastest cars. And Courtney was able to get by. We saw him battling there with Rick Kelly. Now he drives pretty much in and around the outside of his brother Todd Kelly. So Courtney's got good pace. Courtney now in ninth. And he'll be chasing his teammate Garth Tander, who's just up the road. And Winterbottom's not been able to make any great impression on any of these guys today. He's in 13th, so I'm thinking championship when I make that remark. He's fourth coming into this race. 186 points back. He was actually tied on 1773 with Craig Lowndes. It's going to hurt a bit today. Everybody has one of these on occasion. For Wind Cup, for Lowndes and for Van Gisbergen. In front of him in the championship, it looks like it's going to be a more profitable afternoon. So at the moment, the guys are right on the cusp, roughly 10 laps to go, right on the cusp of how hard do they use the tyres. And okay, we've got a bad sportsmanship flag for car 88, exceeding the track limits at turn five. So that's the, he's the leader. So that's a warning, a bad sportsmanship flag for Jamie Winkup. We saw him do it at the end of the race yesterday. And you can see Dave Couchy there, the engineer. Jamie Wink up and this is a serious this is a serious one this is right there you can't run all four wheels over the yellow line so he's got to the point where 
the next infringement will be a pit lane penalty. And for Wink Up, that's a serious one. That means that all concentration, all work on ensuring that he contains the slide and holds the car inside. Murph? Yeah, boys, I actually caught up with Jason Barguana before this race started. He gave us the rundown on how they monitor this because the teams don't, don't see uh, the hops going over the timing line down there when they use too much of the track. Um, it is just uh, judged by Jason Barguana. So if he gets information that the car is using too much road there too often, then he will tell the team that they need to watch it. So it's just adjudicated by judge of fact. So there's the bad sportsmanship flag being shown to Jamie Wincup, and uh, he's pu obviously pushed the envelope. So uh, do it one more time, and he could be in for a PLP. So Jason Barguana keeping a very close eye on these guys at Turn 5 and at Turn 8. And where that becomes really important, as you know, Greg, the back end of the race, if you're having a huge battle with somebody and you need every last millimetre of track, he's got no get-out-of-jail-free cards anymore. Now, at the moment, he's got a margin of 1.8 seconds over Craig Lowndes. He is targeting that 100th supercar victory, Jamie Wincup, but he can't afford to slip up now. And he's certainly got no space at that location on the racetrack uh, if that happens again, or at turn eight. Yeah, so we've seen in qualifying that if you went too wide, which really hurt James Courtney today, he was going to be fourth. If you, if you put the best sectors together for Courtney, see Dale Wood down the inside now. Carl Reinley, you don't need both cars to turn in there. He's way out wide. And he got away with it. They both slowed right up. That was close. As soon as you get out to the marbles, very hard to maintain control of the car there. Well done, Carl Reinley, to keep the car on the black stuff. But we saw the way that that penalty is incurred in qualifying is basically to wipe your time in the race. If you keep on doing it, you get the warning. Jamie Winkup now has the warning. Keep an eye on the lap speed now because Winkup is leading by almost two seconds, 1.8 seconds over Lowndes. He's 1.3 seconds in front for Mostyn. And then a big gap to Van Gisberg at 11.2, but Moffat's taken a lot of ground out of Van Gisberg and he's only 0.9 behind. in behind Fabian Coulthard. They're having a pretty good battle. So this Dale Wood and Carl Reiner. So this has obviously gone on for a while. They've had a pretty big exchange there. That was pretty wild because it almost put Dale Wood into the fence on the right-hand side. Rubbing on the way up the hill. This is Mark Winterbottom, who's currently 13th. Yes, as you said earlier, really struggling for pace. And then there's a Nissan sandwich. <laughs> Yeah. Richard Emery won't be liking the look of the three guys there all hooked together. Todd Kelly, Rick Kelly and Michael Caruso. It means they are all maximising whatever performance they've been able to tune this weekend. Whenever you see cars in a cluster like that, pretty typifies that, well, whatever they've, whatever disease they've got, they've, they've all, all got, got it. it. <laughs> well, it's uh, position 10, 11 and 12 for Todd, Rick and Michael. We're riding with Mark Winterbottom in 13th. 2.08 seconds margin wink up to Lowndes. These fellows are around about in round terms 30 seconds from the lead. On our 44th lap of the race. We'll have a bit of a look at margins here for you. That's what 2.2 seconds looks like. It's another 1.7 back to Chaz Mostert. That's your top three. Then it's a fairly decent gap back to Shane Van Gisbergen. There he is. Memory serves me, he didn't quite have the tyre condition that Greg Murphy updated us on in the final stint of the race. So that's hurt him, but he could have a battle on his hands with these guys behind him because both Coulthard and McLaughlin have been quick just in recent laps. Then it's Tander followed by his teammate James Courtney. And then the battle that we just spoke about before, these fellas are just on the edge of the top 10. So we've got Todd in 10th, Rick 11th, Michael Caruso and Frosty battling for 12th and 13th, and then some air back to Scott Pye. He's got pie to Chris Pitha, Tim Slade, who's also on the limit for exceeding the track uh, track limits and the painted lines at five and eight. And then Jason Bright, he's in 17th. Cam Waters, 18th. David Reynolds, Nick Perkat, Dale Wood, Carl Reinlett, Tim Blanchard, Andre Heimgartner. That's the top 24 cars. And only two after that. Uh, Some ugliness to unfold here. 
just it just looking like you're such a positive guy. <laughs> no, it just looks like there's some desperation <laughs> building in. <laughs> Frosty. It is, does have that feel it about does, it. Does doesn't it? Yeah. 10, 11, 12, 13. It's got pie in behind them. So Moffat for me is the one that's interesting. He's now got that gap down to 0.6 behind Van Gisbergen. And now Frosty goes the high line to turn back down the inside. There's Scott Pye. Chris Pither, remember, he, he stopped very late, so he'll have good tyre quality. He'll be coming forward. Frosty couldn't quite get that done. And 33-3 for Winkup, 33-3 for Lowndes, 33-5 for Moston, 33-4 for Van Giersbergen, 33-1 for Moffat, 33-1 for Coulthard. So those two guys are the fastest in that lead group. Moffat of the top cars at the moment is the fastest and he's been that on a couple of occasions. As Pitha makes the run down the inside of Scott Pye. There's Tim Slade watching brief for him. And here is James Moffat. If uh, he stays where he is, this will be the best result for him this year. His previous best at Phillip Island in race number six was a seventh. So he's on for a season best result here, and he looks very strong. That's Shane Van Gisbergen in front of him uh, in position number four. So this is a good run. He was just being encouraged by his engineer. We've got really good pace. Let's use it well. And remember, we were critical of this strategy of hanging out for longer, but what it does now is it serves him well given the length of, of stint time on these tyres. Picked up the inside kerb then, and because of the nature of the kerbs, and it's a sawtooth, Valolunga kerb is the technical description, rattled the car sideways, literally. And as he tried to pick up the throttle in second gear, it jumped sideways on him. See how he can position the car a bit shallower in the mid corner. There's a chance for a rest and a think now. Be looking at the vulnerabilities on Shane's car. One. Shane carried oh. quite a lot of brake in the mid corner then and it's dancing in the rear. It doesn't have a lot of grip. So he had to carry the brake. That's using the brake pedal for longer. Keep the load on the nose and get the car to turn. James is all over him. With a bit of patience and just the right move at just the right time, you'll get him. But he's oh. lit up the rears on the exit of two. Short shift into third gear. Braking into wheel spin so easy with more than 600 horsepower in these cars. And he doesn't have a big cushion because Fabian Coulthard's right behind and his engineer, Phil Keats, just been counselling him about the margin. He said, I don't want you to get too close too soon or everything just goes hot and greasy. So they're playing a strategy game behind in car number 12 as well. The guy that's also very fast at the moment, James Courtney. He's down in ninth. He's taken a huge amount of ground on the car Tander in the last lap. So Tander was ninth fastest. Courtney was fastest. Oh. Tagged him. He locked up the rear, James Moffat. He's tagged Van Gisbergen. Wasn't close enough. That's McLaughlin. Up two spots and a gift for Fabian Coulthard to fourth. He didn't even have to work it, and Grant McPherson frustrated. As it turned out, Shane only lost one spot, but certainly didn't need to have that contact there. James is a little prone to that stuff. He tends to just get caught up a little bit too much in the drama. Here, it is Here we go. So around the back of the hill at seven. And if you look at the rear of the Volvo, he just late in the stop, he's got the rears locked and he tags the Holden in the right rear quarter panel. Let's listen. He wasn't up far enough. No. And he's waited for him, so he hasn't grabbed a position out of it. They both dropped a couple of spots to Coulthard. There's Fabian in the background. Here's the other angle. Not up far enough. And crunches into the right rear corner. Rear of the wheel on the Holden, in fact, is what it's like from Gizzy's perspective. It always looks worse for the guy trying to overtake because once you've worked out that the lead driver is turning across on you, you actually brake the car harder and try to avoid the contact. So if, if James fired in there, he was probably going to spear into his sort of rear door, but in the end, he ran into his back wheel. So it looks worse for Moffat. 
and the reality of that is that James will be lucky to not get some sort of penalty. He did redress himself as they got going. He let Van Gisbergen get back in front. And Jason Barguana's point of view there is that he'll occasionally live with it, provided you weren't seen to get the gain. But it doesn't deal with the fact that the other competitor took a loss in the process, and that's a hard one. So we'll leave it in his hands, but it's tricky to manage. 2.6 seconds is the gap, Wincup over Lowndes. So Jamie Wincup on target here at the moment to click Supercar Victory 100. Lowndes in his 600th race. Their teammate Van Gisbergen now back into fifth after that. How's this? There are six cars locked in combat here. That's a pressure group. And it's led by Todd Kelly, then his brother Rick, followed then by their teammate Michael Caruso. Altima, Three, Altima, lane, Altima. Drive through penalty, car 34. Pit lane drive through penalty, car 34 for a, for a driving infringement. There you go. So, in the eyes of the investigating and prosecuting officer. See, I don't agree with that. I, that, that to me, that penalty doesn't fit the crime. He needs some sort of penalty, whether it's a time penalty at the end of the race or some sort of suspended penalty over that. But at the moment, what that does is that just smashes him. He was, he was having a go. It wasn't a, a manoeuvre that was genuinely on. He does deserve a penalty, but a drive-through is too severe. And his best result of the year was a seventh. He's currently in sixth, though, even with that moment at turn eight, he was looking at the best run he's had so far in 2016 and that's going to put him literally at the back of the field here we are on board he'll be getting that message and i'm sure he's uh, he's not happy we we'll need to filter this chat and i and i would be the same I, I i just think that always in this game like all sporting contests there's got to be penalties for infringements and making the penalty fit the crime is important that one is overboard We'll see what that does for him. You just, yeah, you can see. I mean, James is an emotive guy. He's trying very hard. It's one of the best performances of the year. Or the, he was on for the best result of the year, but also he's been very fast. He's been pretty much as fast as McLaughlin the whole weekend. And when you're going well and you see a bit of a form resurgence, you'd like to get a result. And as it was, Fabian Coulthard was the only one that really got a gain out of that move. He maintained position with Van Gisbergen, and Van Gisbergen lost one spot. For that sort of penalty, as I said, I think it's over. So he's going to drop back in just inside the top 20. So James Moffat now slots into 18th between Jason Bright and David Reynolds. Here are the margins at the front. So the Mostert charge is eased up now. So Wincup maintains good, consistent pace. He was the third fastest car on the last lap. There's the margin to Lowndes, 2.7 seconds, and Most at 11th fastest on the last lap. One more to go, 2.7 for car behind. Bring it home. Just a little over 3.9 kilometres for Jamie Wincup. Car number 88, it's a brand new Red Bull Racing Australia Holden Commodore. 33 years of age. In 2014, an unprecedented sixth supercar title for this guy surpassing the late great Pete Gagan and champions Dick Johnson and Mark Scaife who stands alongside me and in 2014 it was the fourth title in a row a career that started with Gary Rogers back in 2002 this is his 179th round start in supercar competition and after yesterday's race 397 races in the supercar business his conversion rate is all time unbelievable 25 percent of the races that this young bloke has tackled he's won after yesterday it's 160 supercar podiums 40 percent of the races have resulted in a podium and that's all but unprecedented in this business 69 supercar pole positions Four times a Bathurst 1000 champion, three times a runner-up. As I said before, six times a supercar champion and twice a runner-up. Stung last year by a championship result that bewildered him. He gasses it up, slides it onto the straight. And Jamie Winkup nails the ton. 100 supercar victories. Thank you, thank you. Well done, Jamie Wincup. Awesome.
And well done. Congratulations, mate. 100 wins, mate. Well done. That is awesome. And well done to all the team. After turn two, that's your that's your stand-down race engine, mate. Just keep on for that stand-down race engine. Smooth those tyres, mate. Celebrate that. You you deserve it. You're awesome. Well done, David Couchy, and all the team at Triple Eight Racing. Everyone involved. Extraordinary to have a weekend like they've had with Jamie Winkup now bringing up the century and it's been a hectic battle here for Todd Kelly who comes home ninth and holds them off but this needs to be celebrated 100 wins the only man other than Craig Lowndes to achieve that the six championships that Neil took you through it's an amazing record amazing conversion his pace is extraordinary. He's had 69 pole positions. He's fast. He doesn't make mistakes. I've said it many times. He's very brock like in the way he goes about the early laps of the race. He was in an epic battle yesterday with Shane Van Gisbergen, and today his pace has shone to be able to bring car 88 home in front of the field. We salute. Jamie Winkup for all that he's achieved and Craig Lowndes today on the podium 600th supercar race 20 years after he won here in 1996 and he's still shaping up as a formidable opponent in the business and a great drive by Chaz Mostert for position number three and I think Caruso cleared Rick Kelly in the back end of that race as well to come home in 10th place in the Nissan so Winkup, Lowndes, Mostert, Coulthard nice run from Van Gisberg and turn at turn eight by James Moffat, who will be pretty cranky at the end of this one. And Gisbergen followed by McLaughlin, Tander, Courtney, the Holden Racing Team cars, seventh and eighth, Todd Kelly, ninth, Michael Caruso, tenth. But hard not to focus on this amazing performance. And he said to me on Friday night, haven't really found the rhythm yet, but we're working on it, and they certainly have been. And already so far this year, he came into today with 10 podiums, so it's not just about the poles or the wins, it's all the other stuff that comes along the way. Seven times he's been runner-up in races this year. And he's also picked up a third, but this one's a key win. He threatened to do it yesterday, 